Welcome back to Card80s.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, The Case for Free Speech with John Stuart Mill. In this video, we're going to be looking at a very controversial subject, specifically free speech versus feminism. And what we're focusing on this is not feminism writ large, but rather specifically the idea of pornography as a type of free speech and whether people should be allowed to create pornography. Before we get going, a demonetization warning. The following video contains academic discussions of rape, domestic abuse, adult, and child pornography. If you're concerned about this, feel free not to watch. Also, as a warning, this may, ironically, lead to the video being demonetized. Ironically, because it's a series about censorship. If you're concerned about that, feel free to donate on Patreon to support the channel. And as a reminder to any YouTube censors that are out there, if any of the videos in this series get demonetized, we're tacking on a video at the end about YouTube and censorship. So, with all of that said, and everyone that wants to get out of the room, out of the room, let's get started. So, in a previous video, we offered definitions of three different types of feminism. Political, philosophical, and methodological. To be very, very clear, when I give you the kind of clickbaity title of free speech versus feminism, we're talking about a very specific position held by a specific philosopher who is found in the feminist tradition and uses feminist methodological arguments to argue for it. Therefore, she's considered a methodological feminist, and so we're saying it's an argument against feminism because it's an argument against someone within that philosophical tradition of argument. Not that this is something that's implied by feminism, as there are some feminists that would disagree with McKinnon on this. Specifically, what we're going to be looking at here is the position held by Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin that pornography is immoral and should be censored by the government. Note that many feminist philosophers disagree with position, just as plenty of ancient Greek philosophers disagreed with Epicurus, but that doesn't mean that it's outside the feminist tradition any more than Epicurus is outside the Greek tradition. So, with all of that out of the way, and it very clear that we're focusing on a specific argument offered by McKinnon and Dworkin against pornography, let's get going. So, pornography, by many definitions, is a type of speech as much as any other video or book. And to be clear what we're talking about, we're talking about explicit, sexually explicit material, whether that's a video, an image, a painting, a sculpture, or text in a book. Therefore, there is a question of whether it should be considered censored on the grounds that it may cause harm. McKinnon argues that in some cases, pornography does cause harm, and therefore should be censored. Note that initially, we're only going to be discussing porn between two consenting adults. We are going to cover child pornography, but that's going to be in the second half. For now, we're just talking about consenting adult porn. So, in order to make this case, McKinnon makes a distinction between erotica and pornography. According to McKinnon, both may be explicit and create sexual arousal. However, pornography is not moral because it degrades, harms, or endangers the lives of women. So, the key here is she is dividing all of kind of broad erotic material into two categories. Erotica that doesn't degrade, harm, or endanger the lives of women. All of that is fine, whether it's a book, movie, what have you. And pornography that degrades, harms, and endangers the lives of women which could also be in itself a video or even a book. Therefore, any explicit material which does not degrade, harm, or endanger lives of women is acceptable and could be classified as erotica, while all other such material could be censored and would be considered pornography. Now, at first glance, this seems very much in line with Mill's harm principle. Mill says that if you have things that can cause direct harm, we as a government have a right to censor them. But if you have things that don't cause that direct harm, then no. So at least in the basic framework, McKinnon and Mill seem to be on the same page. The problem is going to come down to the details of what exactly McKinnon considers a type of harm and whether that will map onto what Mill would consider a type of harm. 
So to dig into this, let's look at the very specific definition that McKinnon and Dworkin offered. They drafted a city ordinance which defined pornography very specifically as, quote, the graphic sexually explicit subordination of women through pictures or words that also includes women dehumanized as sexual objects, things, or commodities, enjoying pain, humiliation, or rape, being tied up, cut up, mutilated, bruised, or physically hurt, in postures of sexual submission or servility on display or display, reduced to body parts, penetrated by objects or animals, or presented in scenarios of degradation, injury, torture, shown as filthy or inferior, bleeding, bruised, or hurt, in a context which makes these conditions sexual. This is a very, very broad definition. And while many of the things in there may be viscerally painful or concerning to people listening to it, note that this is a disjunction, not a conjunction for most of the statement. That it's not all of these things that happen have to happen, but any one of them that needs to happen to be classified as pornography under the broad definition of harming, degrading, and dehumanizing women. So... If we stand by Mill's harm principle, McKinnon needs to show that pornography so defined does direct harm to someone. McKinnon makes three arguments claiming that it does. Pornography makes women that participate in it sexual slaves. Pornography makes men more likely to commit rape or domestic abuse. And pornography limits women's rights to free speech. We will take each argument one at a time and see if it fits with the standards that Mill outlined. So, the first argument is that pornography is a form of sexual slavery. By anyone engaging in any kind of sex work under this theory, they are engaged in some kind of sex slavery. This is based on the claim that sex workers are subject to inhumane conditions, similar to forced labor or very hard labor or dangerous jobs. And it's basically the claim that people working in the sex industry are directly harmed by pornography being legal because it causes them to be in inhumane conditions. Now, there's a debate to be had around whether the porn industry actually constitutes inhumane conditions. However, Setting that aside, even if we were to accept that it does, this argument fails, because harsh working conditions are not inherent to porn any more than they are inherent to mining. Any workplace can be harmful, given insufficient regulation and a greedy enough company. If the industry that had, had sufficient workplace protections, this would not be an issue. McKinnon's argument is a case for labor regulations, not the elimination of pornography. Additionally, it completely fails with a range of other types of porn that don't require actual actors to be in them, whether that's paintings, written erotica, animated pornography, and so on. So, not only does it fail to deal with those whatsoever, it also has this problem of if you simply regulated the industry better, you would not have these problems in the same way that miners dying from a buildup of a gas in a mine isn't a problem that mining is inherently, inherently immoral, but rather a problem of we have done a bad job of regulating the mining industry. The second claim that McKinnon makes is that pornography makes men more likely to commit domestic abuse and rape as it glorifies these things. The claim here is that if we do not censor pornography, there will be higher rates of real physical harm towards women, and therefore we should censor pornography. Here, the, the previous argument had some trouble actually showing that a harm was being done. This one, the harm is real, but the connection of it being direct is going to be more difficult to show. So there are three concerns with this claim. The first is that McKinnon has not sufficiently shown that there is a link between pornography and domestic violence. This is a problematic claim as the rise of the internet in the 90s and early 2000s and the proliferation of internet pornography that coincided with that also coincided with a significant drop in crime rates, including rates of rape and domestic abuse, at least in the United States. Additionally, there's not substantial, robust scientific evidence showing that even if we, there were a correlation 
that this were the result of causation and not simply other factors. So the first problem is that it's not just the fact that there's no correlation, it's that there seems to be a negative correlation between the mass distribution of pornography brought on by the internet and the drop in rates of domestic abuse and rape. Now, there's all sorts of reasons for that, but until we have a controlled study, the evidence doesn't seem to support McKinnon's claim. Second, even if we assume that there is a link between pornography consumption and an increase in domestic abuse or rape, it would not necessarily follow that this is a direct harm. There may be a correlation between articles in the newspaper about how corn dealers are starving the poor and attacks on the homes of corn dealers. That does not give us the right to censor those people's opinions. Even if evidence of this link were to be found, it seems very indirect, and so does not meet Mill's bar for direct harm. The problem is that it's not that these videos are immediately inciting people to go off and do this, it's that there happens to be some kind of vague correlation here that eventually some people that watch porn go off and commit domestic abuse at slightly higher rates. Even though that hasn't been shown in any way in the scientific evidence, even if we assumed that, it's really hard to show that this is a direct connection or a direct harm. The third argument that McKinnon puts forward is that porn causes non-physical harm by showcasing the oppression or subordination of women. This undermines public support for women's free speech and civil rights by convincing consumers of porn that women are simply objects and that this would lead to discrimination. Now, this has difficult things on both of the sides of showing that it's real harm as all, and also showing that there's kind of that direct impact. But it seems to be one of the things that McKinnon really does care about. The idea that pornography degrades women in a way that it makes consumers of pornography believe that women are objects or women are disposable or all of these things. Here again, though, the evidence doesn't seem to bear it out. Though correlation does not imply causation, Countries that ban pornography include Saudi Arabia, Iran, Sudan, and Afghanistan. Countries where women are arguably the most oppressed. If you look into the laws that Saudi Arabia has around what women can and can't do, it's frightening. While countries which allow pornography include most Western countries, like Finland, where the leader of literally every party in the coalition government is a woman. Additionally, as with the case of abuse, women have gained ground in the fight for equality and equal rights since the rise of internet pornography. The opposite data would be needed to show that this was causing harm. If countries that completely cut off pornography were more likely to have women in leadership roles and have women's rights laws on the books, and if the rise of internet pornography led to a falling back of women in leadership roles, then this kind of correlation would exist. Because that correlation doesn't exist, it doesn't seem like there's empirical evidence out there. And we should be at least really skeptical of this claim. It's not to say that the opposite is definitely true. It's to say that we should be skeptical of the kind of empirical claim that's being made here. Second, a range of media depict crimes including murder, slavery, and genocide, be that a movie, a television show, and so on. These media do not advocate for these things. They simply depict them, whether that's in telling a fictional story or documenting something that actually happens. Even the most graphic pornography does not generally advocate for the degradation of women as a group. There's not much philosophizing in pornography. Usually, while it may depict it, it doesn't say that this is what you should do. It simply depicts actors portraying it. If watching videos of violence doesn't degrade life, or watching Schindler's List is not anti-Semitic, it's hard to see how watching pornography, which merely depicts actors portraying such a scene, is immoral. If the pornography itself is not advocating for that immoral action. And third, even if one were to create a video advocating for the oppression of women and include pornography in it, which would be an interesting pornography, but you never know what's out there. 
Mill would still argue against its censorship, as he claimed that any opinion, no matter how vile, should not be censored. Mill would argue that we need to see that such an opinion still exists to remember that we need to keep fighting against it. He would say that one of the reasons that the broader left has a problem with understanding why so many elections have gone against them recently is because they have perhaps not through government, but through social norms, censored opinions that they disagree with, which has led to them stop realizing that those opinions need to be fought for. When you censor the opinions that you disagree with, you end up re not remembering that you need to fight for those opinions to exist, and you forget the arguments, and those arguments lose their power. If we censor these kinds of opinions, we do not realize how prevalent they are, and may become lax in our objections to them. Watch my video on the harm principle for more on that, because I think that is a good and powerful argument for the case that we need to have opinions of all stripes out there. Now, we're going to move on to child pornography. There's one type of pornography which is generally considered unacceptable by most everyone. Pornography involving minors. This is because the creation of that pornography required sexual activity of someone below the age of consent, something that society views as always harmful. This said, there are two cases of child pornography which are borderline and warrant some debate. The first is epitomized in the Pulitzer Prize winning photo of Fan Thi Kim Phuc. I'm sure I mispronounced that, or Napalm Girl. This picture depicts a young girl running down the street, crying, naked, and severely burned from a napalm attack during the Vietnam War. Despite fitting the technical definition of child pornography, depicting a naked child, photos where the photographer is simply documenting the horrors of war or tragedy are often considered exempt, as the photographer did not cause the harm by taking the photo. And the photograph can arguably do a great deal to convince others of the horror of the tragedy and stop more people from suffering. So, this is a borderline case, and there are people that have argued on both sides of it. Mill, being someone that is all for the free marketplace of ideas, I think would come strongly down on, we need to see these kinds of images, because those are the images that will convince us that napalm is a bad thing. But... The second deals with fictionalized child pornography. This may include such instances as actors portraying younger characters in sex scenes, or even just coming-of-age novels describing early sexual encounters of people that are technically below the age of consent, or just sculptures of nude cherubs that are clearly children in the sculpture but also clearly naked. My intuition is that most people would think at least some of these are acceptable types of child pornography, as no children were harmed to make them. And our main concern with child pornography is that there are children involved in it who are being harmed in its making. In the face of Mill's harm principle, to show that any of them are unacceptable, you need to show that they cause direct harm. Which I would argue, in the case of fictionalized child pornography, is easier said than done. That said, there may be a stronger case for some of McKinnon's arguments about correlation of if there's an increase in child pornography, does that create a market for it? Does that, even if it's just fictionalized, does it create a market for non-fictionalized child, child pornography that does in fact lead to an increase of abuse of children? If you were to do an empirical study and find that to be the case, that would be some very convincing evidence that even fictionalized accounts may have their problems. But, whew, that was a wild one. What do you think? Should the government censor pornography? Does pornography do real, direct harm? Are there cases where instances which may technically be classified as child pornography should be permitted, either in the case of fictionalized accounts or in the case of photographers documenting real-world travesties and horrors to break through to people and show them the horrors of war. Leave your thoughts in the comments 
below. Whew. Thank you for making through this tough and intense topic with me. Next up, we're going to be covering another controversial one that I am confident will be censored at least somewhere. John Stuart Mill versus Winnie the Pooh, looking at free speech versus specifically Chinese censorship of the media. Watch this video and more here at carnadies.org and stay skeptical, everybody.